Welcome to my channel. Hi everybody, how are you doing? Welcome back to another episode of Endless Journeys. And today, or later on today, um, in fact, probably this evening, we're going to be discussing the Georgia Madel um, passenger and um, I haven't really uh, found out too much about her yet but um, she is one of many more that we still um, need to um, you know explore and talk about because I have been actually researching uh, so much more into the um, dark waters of um, the area surrounding the sinking of the Titanic ship in 1912 and so I've come up with some very very absolutely fascinating and amazing information information that has been scientifically proven to be true and what it is guys is that I'm debating on whether or not I should um, spill the beans now or maybe wait until I'm finished with the series. I don't know what to do because I, I think that if I tell you now, you're going to look at uh, the sinking of the Titanic and indeed the implosion of the Titan sub as well with a totally different perspective. Um, or at least in my situation, in my point of view, it completely kind of changed everything that I had previously thought about. And so, um, you know, it, it's amazing that people who were traveling on these vessels were not aware, indeed, of the intent dangers surrounding them. And I'm not talking about sharks, okay? <laughs> Let's just make it clear. Um, Sharks would be a whole different category. No, it's something completely different. And I'm, I'm, you know, I, I was floored by what I found out, completely blown away. And so, um, anyway, I don't think that I'm going to introduce that just yet. But I want you to bear in mind, um, so far, what have we found out about? you know, the Titan sub and the Titanic ship, the passengers. What have we been realizing all this time? That um, I want you to focus on what I perceive to be an intensely dark and negative energy. And by that, I'm not, I'm not at all um, uh, talking about satanic stuff okay no no um <laughs> i'm when i say dark i mean so dark that no light can penetrate or bounce off and these waters indeed were so dark and so intensely nothing that um it, it brings a whole new perspective into this um you know, into this uh, phenomenon of missing persons and missing vessels. Yes, I, we are going to get into it. The thing is that no matter how high and low and, and, and hard and wide we search, if it's got anything to do with this scientific phenomenon, we'll never find them, no matter where they are. So I'm going to be talking about that in another episode. And so I hope that I can keep you interested and entertained in the meantime. Because it's every passenger that I review. They had something intensely dark going on in their life. And so 
Uh, let's look at Eva Hart's mother. Oh my God, that poor woman. Uh, I'm sure that her husband must have been an okay Joe, but what she must have dealt with, even uh, before boarding the Titanic, she she was in incredibly brave, guys. And she, she had a lot of hardship going on in her life. So anyway, um, right now, um, I'm doing something else. I am on my way to see if I can find a couple more baskets of those beautiful tomatoes that I picked up last week. And um, also, I'm going to be picking up a, f a couple more mason jars because I ended up breaking a bigger one and I need the bigger ones. And so uh, that's uh, basically where I'm heading right now. And it's a horrible day out. I don't think there's any point in me trying to go for a walk, but we'll see. Um, anyway, that's where I'm going. I'm going to um, the market and I'm going to the Dollarama. And so uh, what I want to do is take the rest of the red peppers that I have in the freezer and make another batch of tomato sauce with those because it's my favorite sauce. And um, I'm going to either freeze another batch of tomatoes and red peppers and I'm also going to bottle a few more jars of tomatoes just so that it can tide me over. And so, um, yeah, that's what I'm up to right now. By the way, I, I just wanted to let you know, I just uploaded the um, Salsa Norma uh, recipe um, yesterday. And I wanted to let you know how it all worked out. The uh, zucchini parmigiana is so delicious. Unfortunately, I won't be able to freeze it uh, because of the egg in it, but I am going to uh, make more pasta, which I've already done, so I can't show you. And so I have to finish that because it's an enormous amount of sauce, and but it's so delicious, guys. And the um, other sauce, the salsa norma, is also beautiful and perfect so i in case you haven't uh, caught uh those two recipe vlogs um be sure to watch them if you want to know how to make those incredibly delicious they're so delicious um these two sauces are out of this world and although it's my first time eating the salsa norma uh, i'm totally familiar and in love and obsessed with the zucchini parmigiana sauce. And so uh, just to let you know, um, I'm having a, a really good time finishing it all off. So I'm back and um, let's start our discussion on Georgette Madill and she was born, she was an, Amer she was an American, um, born in St. Louis, Missouri, um, another person from Missouri and um, her birthday was March the 15th, 1896. So she was younger than the other passengers that we have so far discussed. And so um, her father was um, uh, a jurist uh, of Irish heritage. 
And um, Georgette had two half brothers from um, her father's first marriage. Um, and the mother of that, the woman of that first marriage, or the wife, whatever you want to call her, mother, wife, was Julia Peck. And so um, uh, th those two boys were George and Charles. And so um, uh, Georgette's mother, biological mother, Elizabeth, was the daughter of a clergyman, John McMillan, and um, the daughter of Elizabeth Walton. And so um, both of those, both of uh, Georgette's uh, parents, or at least um, her mother, was a native of Chester, South Carolina, and Virginia. So um, Catherine Walton was from Virginia, and John McMillan was from South Carolina. So they were all American. And so um, Georgette, uh, in 1900, Georgette was living at um, uh, on Lindell Boulevard in St. Louis with her father and Elizabeth. But her father, George, passed away uh, in 1901, in December. Um, it's very similar to um, the another story that we've been reviewing uh, in, in terms of dates and, and uh, so, some cities too, right? And so um, Catherine was, Elizabeth Catherine was uh, remarried. That's um, Georgette's mother. She was remarried in 1904 to Edward Robert. Um, and so he was an, uh, a lawyer um, from Albemarle, Albemarle, Virginia, who had been a close associate and friend of her dad. And also, he was a pallbearer at the funeral of her father, George. And so um, the family did continue to make their home in St. Louis and appeared in uh, and were in 1910 were still residents of the same Lindell Boulevard home before um wow before uh, 1911 um I'm I'm floored this this husband um the lawyer Edward passed away in 1911 and so. That's not very long after they married. They were only married um, a few years, a handful of years. And so that's kind of sad. And so, um, however, Georgette, uh, by 1919, was living in Britain and probably emigrated there in 1911 after Edward passed away. And so Georgette and her mother um decided to take a vacation to Europe and so because they were having serious problems they were having problems uh losing loved ones and so um for their return to America um from Europe they boarded the Titanic at Southampton as first class passengers and so um Traveling with them was uh, a maternal cousin, Elizabeth Allen, and um, her mother's maid, uh, Elizabeth's mother's maid, Emily, and um, someone else, I guess. George, uh, Georgette and her cousin occupy, occupied cabin B5. And so uh, it sounds like quite an interesting group, right? And so... Um, I, I don't know. They were in a very sorrowful situation, guys. Uh, so I imagine there must have been some sort of negative energy. Or they at least they must have felt as though there was some sort of negative energy um, surrounding them. Because, um, you know, Catherine Elizabeth, or Elizabeth Catherine, 
and Georgette had lost two male figures in, in the course of just a handful of years. And so, however, um, Georgette was rescued with her mother, Elizabeth, and their maid, Emily. So um, they were in Lifeboat too, and I believe that Eva Hart was in that same lifeboat. I, I may be mistaken. Um, not the same lifeboat as Molly Brown. So, however, when after Georgette was um, rescued, she continued to travel very extensively, uh, just as Eva Hart and her mother did. And so, um, the thing is, guys, is that I know that trauma and crisis will bring you close to your closer to your family and loved ones and so um her it, what happened is that um her active work she began to become active in work uh with the red cross and in 1917 she um sailed for japan and china and in 1919 journeyed to siberia and so she wasn't at all bothered by the crisis and turmoil, although it must have, of, of the sinking of the Titanic, although it must have made a deep impact on her. And so um, during um, the early 1920s, she traveled around Europe. This would have been before the war, right? And um, she extensively visited Italy and um, France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, Switzerland, Greece, and Britain. And so um, she uh, did stay close to her mother. She maintained a very close uh, relationship with her mother, but continued to travel across the Atlantic um, frequently with her mother. And in September 1932, they were both passengers aboard um, the Titanic's uh, the 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 ship that the Titanic was modeled on, the Olympic, and so um, she was still shown traveling the USA as uh, late as 1956. Wow, that's a good many years later, and um, that was the year that uh, Elizabeth, her mother, died, passed away, and so uh, her. I, I'm glad to hear that her mother lived a long life and managed to, um, you know, face any fears that ships and, and, and traveling might have brought her. Because I know that it might have immobilized many people and given them phobias that they had a hard time dealing with and getting over with. Um, however, um, she was uh, not perturbed at all by that crisis. And so, um, her, in her passport, uh, it describes her as standing five foot seven with blonde hair, hazel eyes, a fair complexion, and medium features. And, um, so in, in 1931, uh, Georgia was married in London, uh, to Alfred, um, wow, he's got about eight names, to, Let's just call him Alfred, okay? <laughs> and um, he's better known as Anthony Bagshaw Matei. And so, okay, that's easy enough. Um, yeah, she, she did marry. And so, um, guys, we're going to stop at 1932. And I'm going to finish the rest of this at home because uh, I'm... It's not a good day. I, I don't think that I'm going to manage a walk. Um, it doesn't feel good to walk around in weather like this. And so I'm going to head on home and I'll talk to you a little later.
everybody I'm home now and so um, I picked up a few more things because the tomatoes I, I couldn't let them go uh, unfortunately I didn't find the basket so I simply bought two bags um, they look like they're the same tomatoes and I know that they're not gonna be this good for much longer so I went ahead and I grabbed about um, 20 of them. I grabbed 20 of them and um, so that would come to about one basket. Um, I, I may as well go back and get another couple. I don't know if it's worth it. Um, and so I was running out of both kinds of cheese so I bought more pecorino and more parmigiano reggiano and a few more olives for the sauce. Um, some of them are for me. I shouldn't be eating them, but. And I bought some fresh basil because I want to put one or two pieces in each uh, jar of tomatoes that I finish uh, and leave them in the refrigerator. And um, one loaf of sourdough bread. I love this bread. And um, yes, I can have an entire loaf a day. And so um, all in all, that came to, hold on, $37.87. And the tomatoes were, um, oh my goodness, uh, $5.99 per bag. One one was five ninety nine and the other was something else, six sixty seven. So the tomatoes were the most expensive things, but they are indeed so good. And um, how much were the olives? Um, oh, hold on. The olives were close to five dollars, close to five dollars, and they're mixed. So. So then guys, I went to two different dollar stores. One was Dollarama, one was another beautiful store that I love. And um, I picked up actually three of these. I'm sure one is in the car. And um, these were $2.49 each. And as you can see, all of my spices are in the same bottle. I have been looking for these for now. This would be the third year. And they only have them at this time of year, but the last time I bought them at a different dollar store, which is now gone and hasn't had them uh, in the past couple of years. So thank goodness I bought a few more. I really needed them or I wouldn't have bothered. You know what I mean? And so um, I bought also hand soap. I, I love this store for the hand soap. I love the way they all smell. They're all different. And so um, with the other one that I left in the car, it came to about 10 bucks. Then I swung over to the Dollarama and I picked up some more decent sized um, jars, mason jars. And um, I'm not that crazy about these kind but they'll have to do. I, I prefer the one that, you know, the two-piece. Not all Dollaramas have those. And so I don't want to spend a whole lot of time looking for things that don't exist. Um, so I decided to just go for these. And maybe I'll pick up more of the others if I do find them. I'm not sure because I'm having a hard time. You know, once I empty the jars... Uh, they all fall over and I broke one already so you know what I mean anyway these were three fifty, so it came to about four dollars um so guys I'm gonna put up the water for my pasta and put these away and um, I am going to sterilize these when I do wash them uh, on another day and uh, like that, I can get busy with my tomatoes and um, make sure that I have everything ready for bottling. And so if I don't have enough, 
I'm gonna go and buy more jars because um, I know that I can get 10 tomatoes in here, so that's perfect. Um, anyway, I'm gonna put the water up. Uh, and then after I'm done with that, we will sit down once more and talk about um, Georgette and um, her interesting life. And so, yeah, that's coming up soon. Um, uh, I'll see you later. Hi guys, so I'm back and um, where we left off before was that um, um, Georgia married Anthony Bagshaw and Anthony Bagshaw was, um, he was, uh, it turned out to be a pretty important guy and um, he was actually the second Marquise and a London-born barrister, as I mentioned before, of Maltese heritage, and the son of um, Alfred Mattei, uh, a barrister from Va Valletta, and uh, the son of Teresa Bagshaw. And so his mother, Teresa, came from a prominent Catholic family, and she had also been the daughter, like Molly Brown, uh, of a judge uh, by the name of um, William Bagshaw, to make it short. And so William Bagshaw was the nephew of a marine artist, Joseph Bagshaw. And so later on in World War II, he served as a captain with the intelligence and was awarded um, uh, a member, an award, which was the member of the most excellent order of the British Empire, and he received that in 1944. And so Georgette and her husband, Anthony, remained childless, but they did live in very affluent areas of London. In the 40s in Chelsea, and in the 50s and 60s, Montpellier Square, Westminster. And so, um, Georgette continued to travel, and she was also quite close with her mother. And um, she traveled quite extensively. And so, uh, she also, later on in, in years, um, in her age, she became overweight, and she was a sharp contrast to her husband, who remained pencil thin. And so, um, she did pass away before Anthony on February 14th, 1974, at 77 years old. And she was buried in um, uh, North Somerset. Uh, she had a, a burial plot. Her widower, Anthony, died in Sussex on September the 26th, 1992, but he was cremated and his ashes um, were buried with her. And so, um, one of the things, guys, that I wanted to remark on about this particular account is this. It's virtually nothing. There's, she, Georgia was not traumatized. She woke up, got on a boat, it's so it seems, and sailed happily to survival. Um, she had her aunt, her mom, her uh, cousin, and the maid with her. So there was a good chance of survival for them. And what I'm saying is that we don't see that kind of, um, we don't see that in the Molly Brown story. We don't see that with Eva Hart, even though they all came from good families and. Um, they were all surrounded by this sense of negative energy, if you understand what I'm saying. Each and every one of these passengers that I have been talking about all had something going on, something dark and put very disturbing going on in their, in their inner life. You know what I'm saying? 
And so because um, Georgette and her mom were there trying to get over the grief of the recent passings of both of their father figures, um, husband and father, um, they, they, they were coming back from Europe. And so, uh, you know, it, it's very weird that um, it differs so vastly. <coughs> Excuse me. It differs so vastly from the other accounts that I've been talking about. And so um, one, of, one of the, a couple of the things that are very debated are the um, crew, the ship crew's treatment of people and the attitude toward um, saving passengers. That is one um, debatable issue. And the other is the, the um, incredible breaking in half of the Titanic, which we have indeed found at the bottom of the ocean. It's in half, guys. It's in half. Um, and yet, so many people tried to deny it up and down. And uh, even those who never saw it, right? Um, that's what I'm trying to say. It was, it became a very hot debate. And so, um, what, there were two city clerks who were interviewed after the sinking, and they both survived, Donnelly and Taylor. And they both uh, spoke out in defense of Ismay, a ship, a lifeboat captain, who um, was unjustly criticized and abused for his actions regarding the Titanic wreck. And so, um, you know, uh, he, he, Taylor did survive, and he, he, um, he, actually got onto the small boat, number two, with his wife, and they were saved. He was a major stockholder. And so, he wasn't turned away, right? Um, I, I'm not sure that I understand the situation. I have to be frank and honest. I don't know why there's such a big um, divergence from Molly Brown's story and Taylor's story. Listen on. And so Taylor um, and his wife were on the deck of the Titanic just prior to and after a striking the iceberg. And it must have been like a tap, from what I understand. And many people slept right through it. And so um, Taylor says, we saw Ismay on the deck when he came up after it occurred, and he looked as though he had just tumbled out of bed, but he was very careful and quiet and quick about getting people into lifeboats. So um, he goes on to say, Ismay did not leave the ship until the last collapsible boat was launched. And then he got in, because there were no other people left. That's not true. Maybe they were all asleep, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure at what time of day um, is uh, Taylor actually got in the boat. Um, he, okay, it was supposed to have struck around 11.40 in the evening and they were there. So obviously they didn't go to bed, right? They didn't go to bed and then get up, but it doesn't make sense if you listen on. Um, okay, so Ismay got, a, got in last and um, they, they actually saw that um, there was a boat there that didn't have enough men on it. They were putting other people in that boat. And um, what happened was, in the end, Taylor wrote a, a letter to Ismay telling him that he thought the criticism and uh, negative attention that was being drawn by the media and the public was totally undeserved. 
And then he goes on to say, I knew Ismay personally. So he was his personal friend. And I am confident he does not deserve the negative attention given him. I'm paraphrasing this. And so um, Taylor described some incidences of the wreck in a very graphic manner. And this is where I, I don't understand, guys. I, I don't understand why it's morning and he doesn't see the ship breaking in half. He doesn't see the, the crew um, leaving passengers behind. He doesn't say any of that. And yet Molly Brown was very adamant about that. And so um, she, she didn't have the same perspective that Taylor did. And um, she actually, you know, told the ship um, captain of that lifeboat, number six, I believe it was, or number 14, I can't remember now, that if um, the captain didn't get in there and start saving more passengers, she was going to throw them overboard. <laughs> we don't see that here, do we? You know what I'm saying? And so um, even though Taylor says um, he made 18 trips across the ocean before, he had never seen icebergs until that trip. How can that be? I'm sure they don't disappear magically. No. Um, that's one thing that I can't believe completely. I know that they move and they float, but um, there would be way too many of them to, you know what I'm saying? Um, we've all seen an image of that massive block of ice. That wasn't going anywhere, guys. So um, this guy, maybe he had a flawed memory, I don't know. And so what he did say is that even though I didn't see the iceberg that the ship struck, um, it had happened to float by before I got on deck. What? He was already on deck, right? Doesn't make sense, guys. Does not make sense. He was already on deck with his wife when it struck. Um, okay, maybe they didn't see it, but it doesn't make sense. There's a time lapse here, and I don't, that's what's throwing me off. And so, um, other, other crew members on the deck said it was 50 feet high, but floated away in the darkness. How can that be? It must have been some fast iceberg. And so now he's talking about the morning. When the sun arose the next morning, I saw my first icebergs. It was the most beautiful sight I ever saw. And as far as the eye could reach, it was one big white field, not glittering like ice, but soft and white as if it had been snowing the night before. In a radius of 10 miles or so, there were maybe a dozen icebergs, 40 or 50 feet high. And around the outer edge of the ice field were other icebergs, but not one in particular seemed to be the one that struck the ship. Okay, okay. And so he goes on to say, there were 36 people in our boat and there was room for about 10 more. Really? That's not what Molly Brown said. Um, we were ordered into it and set afloat. We put three of our passengers in one of the other boats, which had only about 30 people in it. 30 people? Where was everybody else? Um, later, when our boats were tied together, um, the sea became as smooth as glass and the sky was light and I never saw a more beautiful night in all my trips. I saw one of the boats picked up by the Carpathia with only 12 people in it. 
That can't be. Maybe it was. Where was everybody else? And why were people saying there weren't enough lifeboats when they're all empty, according to Taylor? So, um, uh, we steamed around the Carpathia in the ice field for several hours looking for survivors. And the small boats and the ship picked up a few survivors who were floating in the water until daylight. But we did not see any people floating on the ice. Wow, that would have been around the spot where the Titanic broke. And so um, while we were on the Carpathia, we passed a school of about a dozen whales and later on we passed a seal that was floating on a cake of ice. A little farther on, we passed a big float of ice on which there was a big white polar bear prowling around. So guys, um, never have I heard any of such detail from any other accounts. Um, it, it sounds a little bit like a Disney trip. Um, however, at that point he was safe on the Carpathia, so maybe he was relieved. I, I don't know. I, I don't understand the difference in perspective between Eva Hart and Taylor, who met, does not mention any screams, and, and Georgette, who doesn't mention anything, and Molly Brown, who wanted to throw the captain overboard because he refused to go back and look for passengers. It doesn't make sense, guys. And, and then um, Taylor goes from morning to night to morning, and he would have us believe that the ship bumped against the iceberg, and then he went down below deck for a good night's sleep, and then woke up and was miraculously saved. Uh, I don't understand it. Um, he was there when, when he was on the deck. And then he talks about coming back up to the deck. I don't understand it. There's an account here, maybe he went down to get something. Of course, he would have had to, right? I, I don't understand the time frame. Where was he? Was it night, day, morning? Where was he? In the boat? Below? On the deck? I don't know. And so, um, you know, he also says we never expected any such demonstration when we got back to the pier. And um, there was a lot of uh, commotion and hustle and bustle. And Taylor said, I never saw so much in print about any catastrophe. Many of the survivors were half sick or dopey when we landed and could hardly talk about what they had been through. Why? Molly Brown talked. Eva Hart spoke. I don't understand it. And yes, I know that a good many of them were in shock. So. And that may have had something to do with his statement. And um, so about the incident uh, with the iceberg, Taylor says, we were rushing along at high speed when the ship struck. But I don't know just how fast. I don't believe there was any dinner party um, going on, as other people have mentioned. Well, there should have been, there would have been. That is what the itinerary uh, was all about. Um, so, you know, um, it just doesn't add up. It doesn't add up, guys. And so what I'm trying to say here is that I have never seen such a big, vast difference in all of these perspectives uh, based on the passengers that I've been talking about. And so I... I really have a problem with this account because it's confusing to me. And maybe it might be the way that it was told to, uh, you know, the interviewer. I don't know. Maybe 
something is being covered up or maybe it's just a haphazard way of telling a, a very complex and a terrifying story but why you know Georgette doesn't say anything about being perturbed disturbed traumatized she wasn't and, and Taylor would have us imagine that he just woke up and you know was miraculously saved in the morning um, and everything was beautiful there were no screams there were no fights, there were no threats. That's not what other people told us. And so um, even, even the ship crew, which, uh, who tried to deny that the ship ever broke in half, uh, even though people saw it break in half, uh, people like Eva Hart, they saw it, but he admits he wasn't there on the deck at the time that it happened. But he tried to tell everybody who saw it that they were wrong and that they were lying and they had it all wrong. And then when he was questioned further, he said, well, I don't want to talk bad about my employer, White Star Line. Well, then don't say anything, but don't lie either. You know what I mean? Um, so I really, really doubt the veracity of this particular account. And so I don't know if something is being covered up. I don't know if it's got anything to do with the phenomenon that I want to talk to you guys about later. I don't know. It's just that um, when you talk, when you look at Georgette's version, um, she went on to travel extensively with her mother and she had no trauma. She had no ordeal after it. She didn't go through a hardship. She was there with her mom, her maid, her cousin. She was okay. Um, so I don't understand the vast difference of these accounts, uh, between all of these accounts. And so guys, I hope that you've enjoyed listening and watching. Um, I hope that you've enjoyed coming shopping with me and looking at my hauls. Thank you very much for watching and please don't forget to like and subscribe. We will pick up this story with another passenger in a few days time. Bye-bye.